Hello everyone and welcome to a special episode of Brain Food I like to call Playwright's Delight. It's time to try to Now, this episode is going to be a bit different for me, mostly because I never saw the play Topa, or Anne and Me, and the writer, Sean C. Harris, was kind enough to send me the script for it. As she lived at New York City during the time of the play, it was quite impossible for me to attend considering my own time and budgetary restraints. So I'll be analyzing and reviewing the play based on its script alone. And let me tell you, it's a wonderful script that has some very poignant statements to make about racism in today's society. The basic story of Tolpa, or Anne and Me, is about a webcomic artist and Anne Hathaway, who regularly visits her apartment through the television. like that, and there's no psychic eye death either, but rather a personal discussion of racism between the two. One of the things that I really liked this script as I read it was how it could be personalized with the name of the city as well as the name of the lead actress playing opposite the Anne Hathaway character. It's a minor detail, but I found that as time goes on, it's the little things that can really help to enhance a story. Now, as for discussing racism, why was Anne Hathaway picked as a leading character? Now, my thought on this is that Anne Hathaway is, aside from a great actress who was about the only good thing in The Dark Knight Rises, representative of the white beauty ideal. Mainly in that she's slender, feminine in appearance, straight, white, and able-bodied. The character of the webcomic artist is a black gay woman, and so she, she plays off of everything that popular culture tells women they should be, mainly thin, white, and straight. No, this isn't a direct message, but it's a message hidden in how often we see white women portrayed in a huge variety of roles as opposed to women of color. Heck. Anne Hathaway's first appearance in the play is via the webcomics artist's television, which is a metaphorical way of showing us how whiteness invades and permeates much of our lives. Even though many of us don't watch TV as we normally would 10 years ago, with the advent of online services such as Netflix or Apple TV or even just downloading our favorite programs, a lot of the television that we do ingest is still predominantly white. That's not to say that it's 100% white, but that the roles that people of color, let alone LGBTQ people or LGBTQ people of color receive, aren't exactly positive either. There's an article on Racialicious that discusses the impact of television on young white male children as opposed to young children of color and young white female children, and finds that as positive for the former and negative for the latter two in terms of their confidence. So already at the start of play, we are seeing the impact that whiteness has on our lives. Now, that's not to say we can't use the internet to find programming that involves and is about people of color, LGBTQ people, and LGBTQ people of color, but it's simply not as far-reaching as movies and television. At least, that's how it feels to me, and only then because television is being pushed out all the time. Most of the content on the internet, we have to either look for it ourselves or be told about it through word of mouth. It doesn't have a multi-billion dollar corporation behind it investing millions of dollars in advertisement. More often than not, it's people like Sean C. Harris, the writer of this play, taking what spare time and money they have and hosting it either on free blogging websites or putting it up on YouTube. Now, as the story progresses, a relationship develops between Anne Hathaway and the webcomic artist. 
And the first really striking moment, for me at least, came when Anne Hathaway just snaps and unleashes a volley of racist epithets against a webcomic artist. Guess I ought to be glad you ain't gonna whip me. What? No. Why not? Because. What's stopping you? I don't... I'm not like that. Southern, you know what I mean. Why don't you say it? I'm not racist, you stupid black bitch. Jesus fucking Christ. It's not like you want me to turn some hateful racist bigot. Sometimes I think you hope I do something racist just so you can hold it over my head. It's like you just can't be happy unless you make me feel guilty for being white. It's always walking on eggshells with you. The smallest disagreement, the slightest difference of opinion, and I might as well be screaming N-word at you. Is that what you want? Because I know you imagine me saying it every time I open my mouth. Would you feel better if I did? If you were right? Huh? N-word, 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 N-word. There, I said N-word. Happy now, huh? N-word? You like that? N-word? Is that what the fuck you want me to say, N-word? You're right, N-word. How's it feel, N-word? And no, I didn't use the N-word. Because I'm white, and white people shouldn't use the N-word. At all. Now, this scene in particular points out a, well, point or two about race relations as they stand here in the West. Especially in, well, our post-racial America. Which is that things still aren't good. Hmm? Oh, oh, God, the obvious is so blinding. In a way, it's much like a bully being told to be nice to the bully, trying, failing, and then easily falling back into the ways of bullying. It's a facet of what we here in the West face after, well, a couple hundred years of slavery, which really only just ended over 150 years ago, as well as a large amount of cultural appropriation. And unlike the bullying of, say, one person over another, nothing is easily forgiven or forgotten. Unfortunately, there are some white people that just want black people to forget, well, everything. For a current relevant example, one has only to look at how The Onion, an online satirical newspaper, tweeted that Quevan Jane Wallace was a C-word. For those who don't know, Quevan Jane Wallace is a nine-year-old actress who starred in the movie Beasts of the Southern Wild, which she made when she was just six years old. There is no defense, absolutely None for calling this adorable girl an extremely talented actress who wore a beautiful dress, has a puppy dog purse accessory, and, you know, and pumped her arms when her name was called the Academy Awards, the C word. None. And yet, from what I've been reading and have read, some white feminists have actually come out and told black women not to focus on race, to instead examine the tweet as satire and a shot at the patriarchy. Feminists such as Mandy Statmiller of the online magazine XO Jane, as well as Mary Joanne of the feminist movie review site The Flick Philosopher, have actually come out in defense of the tweet, hiding behind the same old tired argument of racist bigots everywhere that was humor, it was satire, it was just a joke, so get over it already. After all, what's more important is to focus instead on the sexist commentary that was Seth MacFarlane's hosting of the Academy Awards. Because we're all women, we all bleed red, so stop being so divisive. Another aspect is the rather disturbing trend of sociopathic tendencies in whiteness that tells white people, either intentionally or not, to just not give a damn about the well-beings of people of color. This value is held more inwardly, and yet we're also told to give a damn for appearances sake. Because the worst thing that can happen to a white person is to be accused of racism. 
rather than actually addressing the hurt that a person of color suffers due to racism. Now, this ties back into Anne's character later on when she's talking with the webcomic artist after their fallout. You know how when you were little and you believed in monsters? Like monster under the bed? Yeah, and the monster in the closet. Oh man, even now I can't... Anyway, they were just stories, right? Stuff they made up to creep you out. But then you grow up and you find out that there really are monsters, and one of the monsters is you. You might think you're a nice monster and all. You might think you never hurt anybody, but at the end of the day, you still have sharp teeth and claws that can rip people to shreds. At the end of the day, it's right for people to be afraid of you. Sounds really silly, doesn't it? This is what history has left us. This legacy of racism and colonialism. The size and shape of the claws and fangs may change depending upon the country you're in, but they're still there. It's a kind of social programming where we're told to ignore the claws and the fangs that we have, and, well, if someone gets cut when they interact with us, then that's their own damn fault. And what kind of effect does this have on women of color? Well, the webcomic artist says it best when she says, There is always risk where there is love, child. Only one way to know, and that's to try. I know, I know, but I'm tired, Erzuli. I'm so goddamn tired. Tired of seeing myself through a funhouse mirror. Tired of fighting all the time just to be just to be here. Every time I stand up, I get the whole world beat me down. When I open up my mouth to speak, I may as well may as well be a mule brain. Erzuli, you say we made for love. You say you say if there's love, life always means something. I know that's what you say, Erzuli. But that ain't that ain't what I hear. I hear that I ain't good enough for love. I hear that I should do just fine without it. I hear that if I if I change everything about me, everything black and gay and woman about me, maybe some day I can trick some poor fool into thinking I'm worth it. But what if what if I can't? What if I just been too black and too gay and too woman too long? What if all that's left for me is to disappear? Maybe I might as well swallow a bottle of sleeping pills and never wake up. Because women of color, and black women in particular, in the context of being an American, are told that since they're so strong, they can shrug off everything the world throws at them. They're Teflon, they're rubber, nothing sticks to them, and everything bounces right off. So it's A-OK. -okay. Maya Angelou, in her first autobiography, talked about how black women are punished instead of praised for being so strong. Part of it, from how I understand it, for lack of a better word, is that that strength is born of necessity, and the world is going to test it every step of the way. You're not allowed to relax and unwind. You're not allowed to feel sadness or fear or weakness because you're a black woman and black women are strong. Period. How to Play ends with Anne and the webcomic artist starting again from scratch is very much in theme with the play's discussion on racism, privilege, and whiteness because there is no shortcut for this and there is no easy fix. People are going to screw up, especially white people. But the important thing is to apologize, to listen, and do more to become a better person for others as much as yourself. Well, that's been my analysis slash review of the play Topa, or Anne and Me. And I sincerely hope that if you ever get a chance to review or see Sean's next play, Encanta, that you do so. I'm Triple J, and that's all I got left to say. Take care.